Accessing library computer data. Out there, there are no saints. Just people. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. Continuing our run through of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Right now we're up to the episodes called Favor the Bold. And Sacrifice of Angels. It's a two-parter that's going to wrap up the DS9 occupation arc. Favor the Bold, the fifth episode. Sacrifice of Angels was the sixth episode, 27th of October, and then a week later in 1997. The second one aired, written by Iris Stephen Bear and Hans Beemler, directed by Weinrich Colby. In Favor of the Bold, tired of being on the losing end of the war, Captain Sisko convinces Starfleet Command to launch a fleet of starships to retake DS9. Meanwhile, time may be running out for Rom. And then... In the next episode, Sacrifice of Angel, which was directed by Alan Croker, written by Iris Stephen Baron and Hans Beemler, a large fleet of Federation ships head towards DS9 to stop the Dominion destroying the Wormhole Minefield. A Dominion fleet meets them in battle. Can the Defiant make it in time? It's a weird little question that Memory Alpha usually doesn't do, but we're joined by Clay. Clay, how are you? Good. Um, this Odo stuff has officially gotten gross. Oh, yeah? You, you think they, they've they given up on the subtext of it being sexual and having them sit on a bed, putting their clothes back on while they talk about the uh, the nasty that they just did was a little bit over the top? Yeah, a little bit. Um, although I did like the continued thing where they're like, where's Odo? He's been locked in his room for days. <laughs> oh, you're killing your mother, Odo. I like um, the, the female yeah. changing. She's like, interesting. Do they always put it in the butt? Odo's like, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, they do. Is it always that disappointing? <laughs> when I do it, yes. I like how um how open Odo is about his. He's like, I haven't done that a lot though. It, it's like the opposite <laughs> of every single like actual sexual encounter between people who are uh, new at it. It goes like where they're actually being honest instead of lying about how uh, how often they have the sex. I suppose. Yeah, if it was going to be more realistic, it would be Odo thinking it went fantastically, and the the foundation, the founder woman being like. Mm-hmm. Turns out we don't need Odo, guys. Uh, we're yeah. just going to go back <laughs> to the Gamma Quadrant. Odo is not necessary to come back. Can't tell us anything about humanity. Um, yeah, so it's the close of the war, not the war story arc, but the DS9 occupation story arc, which I think is a better title for it, because as we learn at the end of this, the war continues just in a different way. Uh, so let's take a break. I'm going to play an audio clip, and me and Claire are going to come back and break down Sacrifice of Angels and Favor the Bold. Then our first step is to eradicate its population. It's the only way. You can't do that. Why not? Because a true victory is to make your enemies see they were wrong to oppose you in the first place. To force them to acknowledge your greatness. Then you kill them. Only if it's necessary. I had no idea. Perhaps the biggest disappointment in my life is that the Bajoran people still refuse to appreciate how lucky they were to have me as their liberator. I protected them in so many ways, cared for them as if they were my own children. But to this day, is there a single statue of me on Bajor? I would guess not. And you'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it, Clay. We've got a two-header, uh, double-parter here that we're going to talk about. And um, I guess it's, I don't know if we want to start with like a broad overview of it. My opinions kind of are about that, uh, mm -hmm. like a broad sort of take on how DS9 did this first six-episode serialized arc and everything. Um I think it's interesting, sort of looking back on it. We, we always get comments that people uh, complain that it's like, you can't review the series from a modern perspective. You, you, put, you have to put your shoes in the, in the uh, feet in the shoes of somebody who was in 1997 watching this show for the first time. Uh, mm. That's not really the, the way that the podcast goes. So I've had you a... Mean um, someone someone watching TV wondering whether or not the president's going to get impeached? <laughs> basically. Uh, trying, they couldn't even Google pictures of the uh, the dress at that point. They just had to like kind of imagine what they were looking for or find clips out of the newspaper or something. I think... Um, I, I think that the I think that the arc is is good. Um, 
like I, I'll probably start off by sounding more negative. I think the arc is good, but it's been interesting to rewatch this and see how things evolved and like where the show was at that point in time for what they considered mm. they could do on TV. And I think that the wrap up kind of um, summarizes all that stuff. But what, what did you think of uh, Star Trek as a war epic? Um, overall, I liked it, um, but. I, I oddly feel like um, it moved too fast, but there also wasn't enough. If that makes sense. Yeah, um, I one of my big one of my notes is that um, they really started having weird pacing issues in this episode, yeah. where they had to jump really quickly to get something done. The two that I wrote down are um, when Morn delivers his letter to Cisco is a mm -hmm. scene cut and then Cisco's reading the note after that. And then when Odo's turn back to helping Kira at the very end feels mm -hmm. like shockingly like, wow, he just, he just turned right then and there and that's what it's going to be. But they, yeah, I ahead. even like uh, specifically with the Odo thing, I even thought for a second that they were trying to play it as though this was his plan the whole time. Uh, and so I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. That's not how this has been going at all. Um, yeah. I, I, th I, I felt like it was, uh, I thought the first half was a decent episode, but I didn't really think it was, um, there was no urgency to it. And it, there was, there was, uh, it, it felt like a lot of, uh, standing around. Hmm. Um, like, I, you know, I thought the Odo stuff was just tedious as hell in both episodes. Uh, I think Odo's arc is the worst part of the entire thing. Um, <clears throat> I, I we, and we can get to him, but I'm surprised that you said that the uh, you thought it was kind of a lot of standing around because I thought that the favor of the bold episode was one of the few episodes where they made the Starfleet stuff just as uh, impactful. I thought like they made they made yeah. it feel like the Starfleet stuff actually they had their backs up against the wall and that they needed to do something by X and X time, and you you kind of got a sense of this is the last stand that they have to take. Like they have to do this mission or else this is all going to fail in a way that the previous episodes, it felt like they were just kind of sitting around in their office wondering what was going on out the window. Yeah, I guess, I guess maybe it's just the way it was presented. Cause it just, it didn't, it, it, it I didn't feel a, a super sense of urgency to a lot of it. Um, like, you know, you've got a scene, which I enjoyed, but you've got a scene where, uh, Wei Yun is, is contemplating art for like three minutes. Mm-hmm. And I like that scene, but it's it was just sort of like okay, this, we're just sort of hanging out here doing stuff, and even the Starfleet stuff, while it was good, and I, I get what you're saying, it just didn't feel to me like there was much urgency. It felt like people, it felt like they were delivering lines about uh, being pinned into a corner, as though they were just talking about like what the the uh, uh, the performance report for the weekend was. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I guess I disagree with that. I, I think I really I want I think that the first part is much better than the second part in the way that Star mm -hmm. Trek usually is because it's a lot of the the setup and then the the resolution is kind of always a little bit of like yeah I guess it's the resolution of the two part is always feels like um a modern day Game of Thrones where you're like I wouldn't have written it that way and so you yeah. you, you always kind of feel a little bit disappointed where the setup leaves you wanting and I think that the I, I kind of like the Starfleet stuff. Like, it, it even comes down to the basic, like, the fact that this is, like, clearly the biggest Star Trek space battle scene that they've ever done. And mm -hmm. I, I think they get the point across there. If you think about it too much, you kind of come up to the thing of, like, why do all the, why do all 3,000 ships just kind of run into each other in one spot in yeah. space? Yes. Uh, yeah. But outside of that, like, I think that it works for me as, like, a, a suitably epic we've got to do this. You actually see tactics where they send in small bomber ships to like sort of draw mm -hmm. the Cardassians out and you never see stuff like that. And I think it, that it's unique for Star Trek to do that. I actually had some, we don't have to go off of this, but it, it brings my, to me to the point of, I wonder whether Star Trek is really built for the war epic or it, it feels like DS9's attempt at this war epic so far is kind of a half step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we haven't, covered Battlestar or anything, but Battlestar for, to me feels like the full step into this, what they're trying mm. to do here, where this feels a little held back because of the Star Trek um, DNA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think you still run into the same problems you run into generally, where it's like a lot of stuff is happening off screen. 
Um, I mean, they do give you a lot of spe- a lot of battle stuff, but like, there's there's a lot of uh, Cardassians on on Deep Space Nine talking about what's happening outside. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, that's just comes with the territory, unfortunately. Um, because I really like the I, I think that the strongest part of these two episodes is the character stuff between yeah everybody. oh definitely yeah hundred um, percent and I, I think that it's. What I was really struck by here is that the the character scenes, to me, I'm going to again say they feel mature in a way that a lot of Star Trek doesn't. Like the writing between how characters are acting to each other is very different from other Star Trek episodes and TNG mm-hmm. and like early DS9 and stuff like that. Like the, I think a good example is the subtext, which isn't even really subtext, but when, when du, in the second part where Dukat and Weyoun are talking to each other and Dukat's talking about how like you win a ba- you win a war by sort of making the people recognize that going against you was wrong in the first place. Yeah. And Weyoun's listening to him sort of bemused that this is Dukat's attitude. Like he doesn't buy into it. And he's kind of, um, he says he's fascinated. He's not, he's not laughing at him. He's fascinated by this turn of events. And I think it's, what the show did well during the arc, I think, is the the Cardassian and Dominion difference, where Dukat represents this Cardassian thing, which is they are out for the humiliation the, of the enemy, and they're out basically to like uh, out of spite against what has happened to them. Uh, for yeah. the, this is why they're at the war. And the Wayun and the Dominion approach it much more as like we have to win this to win the war. Like don't don't give away the farm yet. Like this is still ongoing. We haven't won yet, and we need to be realistic about it. I think that that kind of um subtext is unusual in star trek to have like that kind of layer in a conflict and i think that that's something that the show really did well during this arc yeah i think the one of the best things they've done is is positioning the uh uh, ducat and the cardassians with the uh dominion as far as what they want out of the situation like they want very different things um and i think that scene with Ducat and Wei Yun is a good example of that, where Ducat, where Wei Yun is like, hmm, we want to rule everything, and in order to rule everything and control Starfleet, we have to just destroy Earth and everybody on it, because that makes the most sense. Yeah, get rid of and any du- potential for an uprising to come out yeah. of this. Yeah. And Ducat has a very different uh, uh, want, where he is he's much more specific about things and he, and he wants, like you're saying, he's working out of spite. Um, and he, and he has a, a much more focused thing that he wants. And I think that, that, that comes out where he's like, no, 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 you have to, you have to get the people to, uh, you know, uh, love, not love you, but you know, whatever he says there. Yeah. Um, to, uh, uh, recognize they made wipe a mistake them all out. in going yeah, against Recognize you. they made a mistake and then let them, let, then they will then, uh, be supplicant to you or whatever. Yep. Um, and I, I think that has always been the, the most interesting part of this, uh, of, of that positioning is, is that Ducat is, has never been just a mouthpiece for the dominion. He has a very clear, um, separate set of things that he's going after. Um, and I love it. I love it at the end too, when, when they're evacuating and, and he has, he has lost his war. Right, but the Domin- the Dominion is like, no, nah, dude, this isn't this isn't the the end of everything. No, um, yeah, the Dominion already admitted. The founder has the conversation with Wei Yun <coughs> about we don't need the Alpha Quadrant. It's more important that we get Odo back. And which that's a first. I I, I don't know. I don't know if I if I uh, has that always been the idea? Because it seems no. But but I think that I think that it balances off of like what you were saying is that the Dominion don't think that they've lost the war because they're willing to evacuate the station at that point and they. Like just like they own an entire quadrant of the galaxy already, you know. This is just like a tiny yeah. thing that they're trying to do, and this is a minor setback in terms of them. But for Ducat, all his world is the Alpha Quadrant. He doesn't know anything else outside yeah, of that. Yeah. So he's yeah. he's consumed by this loss that they've taken, where the Dominion is kind of just like, ah, we're gonna fall back. We'll be back eventually. Let's go back to Cardassian space and, yeah. and resume. I didn't love that line about what matters is Odo because I feel like that was it, that felt to me like they were just trying to make the shit that they did with him for the past two or three episodes actually matter and not just be a waste of time. Mm, yeah, I, I think I yeah, it's interesting. I think I disagree. I think that they do an OK job here between all the founder and Odo scenes of of showing that the changelings are really xenophobic racists who mm-hmm. think less of everyone else like they're. They've said before that their goal is just to protect themselves. Like the reason that they have to, they have to form the Dominion is to oppress everybody else so that yeah. they can't get hurt. And I think yeah. all the scenes of where they're standing on the promenade looking down saying like they look like ants scurrying around 
are the changelings don't care about anything except for each other. And I think the link ties into that. Like the link is so important. And the fact that they would go back to rescue Odo, if you, if you have a problem, I think the problem would be they sent out a bunch of babies out into the universe, baby changelings and didn't seem to care about them. Mm. Uh, so maybe that's kind of a problem, but I think they do a good job of making it just that the founders are so xenophobic and so racist and supremacist about everybody else that I think that they would consider each other to be the most important thing in the universe. Yeah, all right, that's fair, I guess. Um, the the other thing that I think about the uh, the war angle is just that I think that the I don't I don't know how well the series did the plotting of it, but I think that they did the character work fairly well, and I think it all culminates pretty nicely in this one here. I think maybe it took a couple clumsy steps to get to the point where everything wraps up, but I think that they like one of the big differences that they've done is that I think Damar really steps into a, a character. Uh, through these two episodes and Zial also does the same thing. Uh, Zial mm-hmm. dies, obviously, which is what leads to Dukat's craziness and she's killed by Damar. But Damar is interesting just because he, he seems to worship Dukat over anything else. Like he's like, Dukat is a great man and we must respect Dukat and everything like that. And you, you need to listen to Dukat because he's your father. And he's a great man. I think, I think they just did a good job of fleshing stuff out in a way. Like they moved away from the Star trek um, like moral play morality play and it's mm-hmm. more of like this character-based war story and it's it's pretty different from what star trek was doing before that yeah uh i would agree i i think i don't know about how i feel about the killing of of zl at the end because yeah like you're saying it, it comes from a character that it's i don't why he would just do that if he did that when when ducat wasn't there that would be one thing, but I, I i don't know if i buy him <laughs> shooting her over his shoulder right in front of him yeah yeah well, I guess because I guess I would say I'd buy it just because I think Ducat. Well, I guess my bigger problem is I don't know if Ducat's feelings of love for her at that point make as much sense to me as if he was trying to play her at that point. Like I, I still get the sense that Ducat is willing to use his daughter and that he doesn't love her out of a uh, like the usual father daughter sense of love. Like he mm-hmm. he has a Ducat relationship with her. And so that's what I, I I would buy Dumar shooting her if he felt that he understood Ducat better than he seems to at this point, where mm-hmm. Ducat would actually get upset by that. That's my understanding is that Dumar is more about like the Cardassian Union, and he's surprised that Ducat feels that it's not appropriate to shoot a traitor, even if it's your daughter. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I mean, he Ducat talks pretty seriously throughout the whole episode about how his daughter is is you know, basically gets an exception. Um, he does, but he sends Damar to get her instead of himself. You know, when he when he's trying to reconcile with her, he says, you go talk to her instead of me. And then he just sits down and does nothing. Like, that's the, to me, that seems like the political angle of Ducat playing his family. Uh, he doesn't want to get involved. He just wants the results to be there and look appropriate. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I really read it that way. Um, but yeah, I, I, I could I could believe that. Did, um, so what else? What, what's your uh, what's your sort of major takeaways from this? The, the two party or the uh, the thing as a whole? Uh, what would you uh, like about this? I don't this? know. I don't know if I love. I'm very conflicted about the involvement of the prophets at the end. Sure. Um, about. what's that? Yeah, go ahead. We we can talk about that at this point. It's a fairly Be- big thing. Yeah, because I I don't you know I, I'm I'm on record as not really caring for for the prophets, but I, I thought the scene. With Cisco kind of giving the prophets the the business, I like that. Um, but and it's it is very literally a Deus Ex Machina uh, way of getting out of the situation. But I that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad like Deus Ex Machina. I feel like people use that as a short term as a shorthand for bad now. Yeah, and I don't. I, I think disagree. The, I don't think it's Deus Ex Machina. I think a lot of people call it that, but I would I would argue that it's not. I, I would argue it's not a good decision, well, but it's not Deus Ex Machina. I mean, they're literally gods that show up to save the day. They so. are, but they've they've <laughs> been there. They've been there for six years. You know, what, well, like, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. Is that I I think using the term is is overused as as uh, a shorthand for a dis, uh, for bad when it's not right. Because I think in this situation they are an element that has been there. Um, if this was the first time we met the prophets, like they go into the wormhole and they're like, "Hey, there are aliens in here who can destroy yeah. them all." That would be a Deus Ex Machina in terms of writing, but it is a Deus Ex Machina because the prophets are gods in canon. Yeah, 
Yeah, but so I don't know. I don't know how I feel about. It. I, I don't. I, I don't. I didn't find it very satisfying. I'd agree with that. I, I think it's not satisfying. Um, I I still I really love the prophet scenes, like when they're talking to the prophets for whatever mm-hmm. reason. I think that's fairly effective. Um, I I think the problem with it at this point is that we've had so many of those scenes where the show still doesn't want to reveal what the prophets are thinking or why they yeah. do things the way that they do things. That becomes a little bit problematic, and I think that leads to the, like the unsatisfying Deus Ex Machina feeling about it. It's just like, yeah, we'll do this for you. Why not? Uh, why didn't we just pop out two years ago and could have stopped this from the very start, but we didn't? Yeah, like you have you have Cisco in there giving them, you know, the the, the what for, and then they just sort of do it. But they, there's no like, they're also it, they're always so cold about everything. You, there's nothing. You don't you don't see a moment where they've they've where he's gotten through to them in any way. It's just so, they're just sort of like we acknowledge your words, and yep. then they just send him back, and they're like, yeah, we can blow these guys up for you. Well, they want they want him to stay alive is something that they talk about because they say your mm-hmm. game can't end yet, and he says my life, and they said yes, yeah. so they they don't want Cisco to die. But outside of that, I'm not really convinced about why. Uh, if if they want him to live, I'm not really convinced about what they think they need to do. If not destroy the Dominion fleet that's coming through, um, yeah. That, I, don't I mean, know. they could have just as easily like transported him somewhere else, couldn't they? Right. Ex- or, <laughs> right. Know, like yeah, yeah. I don't know what the limits of their power are, but they could have, you know, they zap back and it's like, oh, Captain, all of a sudden we're 600 light years away from deep space, you know, something yeah. like that. Yes. Um. But you know, obviously, that doesn't help your help your situation of the story you're telling. Well, I guess it depends on how mu- how how much importance you think that the prophets actually have for Bajor. I think Cisco tries to lay that out, and so I think that the show is saying that the prophets do care about Bajor for some reason. Mm-hmm. It's just they're they're a little inconsistently written because they always talk about how this is like corporeal matters and corporeal matters, and like we don't care about this, but they do care deeply about things that like that. So I, I wish they were a little bit more consistently written in terms of what their interests were in this whole universe and the show is the show is keeping that close to the to the vest and 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 i don't know if that's appropriate at this point it's been six years i think you can start to lay out what the profits are i i think that this is as as an episode ending i think it's remarkably unsatisfying they this does matter going forward so it's one of those things of the show does kind of fix things as it moves along or if they don't have Mm -hmm. an idea of what's going on they do uh retcon this to make a little bit more sense but at this point i can understand not being satisfied with it well they have that line in there well they have uh i can't remember if it's the first half or the second half where cisco is like uh i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna make my home on bajor no matter how things shake out and then in the prophet's uh zone I don't know what you would call it. The, war- the, the, um, the temple, celestial temple, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, you will never get a zoning permit to build a house on Bajor. <laughs> it's like every time Cisco tries to go there, like the, the housing board doesn't doesn't let him join the co-op. There's a lot of red tape for a special effect, just swirling, yeah. swirling, swirling. What'd you think Which of- I assume will, you know, I'm sure that'll come back at some point. What'd you think of Cisco, I want to live on Bajor thing? I, 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 go ahead. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I kind of, I, I kind of get it. Uh, I, I don't know if has he really expressed that much interest in Bajor? No. Before this, no. Yeah, I, I didn't think so. I think it's something that feels appropriate, but it comes comes out of nowhere, sort of. Yeah. Um, yeah. If he'd been looking at like brochures or something for the past <laughs> couple seasons, uh, but it's one of those things. Like, I think it makes perfect sense, but. The pacing problem is that he he kind of brings it up in such a weird place to this admiral about it. Like it's not he, he the admiral's kind of a weird person to talk to about it because even the admiral yeah. is like Jesus Christ, Ben. Like I didn't ask for your whole life story. Like just tell me where you're going to go on vacation. Yeah, and, it's like Ben, we're in the middle of a war here. Could you <laughs> could you could you close the tab where you're where you're looking at rental places on Bajor? It might just be a, a smoldering husk by the end of this war, Ben. So I wouldn't get too yeah. attached to it. You know, it's one of those things, yeah, I guess it makes sense, but, like, his, because he's always looked out for Bajor, you know, because of the emissary stuff and whatever, but they've never played that as though he loves Bajor and loves the Bajoran people. It just, it it seems like that's just his job. Mm -hmm. His job is to make sure Bajor doesn't get killed. Yes. Um, As a Starfleet officer, you're, you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, so to have him just all of a sudden be like, there's no place in the world or in the universe I'd rather be other than Bajor. It's like, oh, okay. I, yeah. I guess. I mean, I feel the same. I guess I would feel the same way if I was there all the time, too. I don't know. Mm. It's beautiful. Beautiful, they say. So <laughs> I, I, I think it's just a general failing of the emissary storyline here yeah. where like there was only that one episode where they did it really well which was that uh <laughs> it should have been it would have been great if the admiral was like are you just saying that because you know they're going to treat you like a god when you go there <laughs> walk with the prophets benjamin cisco all the way to your new house um <laughs> and i think that the i think that it's just that they did that one episode that starts with an R that I can't remember the name of where we thought that they did a pretty good job of combining the Starfleet and emissary roles. The The problem mm -hmm. is the show never really bought into that and it never really continues with that. So when it brings it up in situations like this, which is the end where I'd have a hard time arguing that the show hasn't earned getting to that point and that the prophets shouldn't interfere in this and that the prophets are like a bad storytelling decision. Well, maybe they're mm -hmm. a bad storytelling decision, but that that they don't make sense in terms of what this story has been for six years. It's just the fact that they they're like one step removed from a Deus Ex Machina, which is like we've had yeah. these guys here, we introduced this in the first season, so it's appropriate to bring them up now. Uh, I just it's hard to come up with a better way that they could have resolved this because they built this to a point where it's either everyone's going to shoot at each other for three years or the profits make them all disappear. Yeah. I wish that they had done something a little more subtle where like they had given Cisco a piece to help him win or something instead of just, you know, doing control all and then hitting delete uh, yeah. over the uh, Jem Hadar ships. Um, like, it, especially since it was, uh, it was sort of the second, um, reinforcements out of nowhere kind of scene like earlier like the the, the first half of the the episode they're like well the klingons we don't know if the klingons are gonna help and yeah. then of course the klingons oh the klingons are here it's exactly when we needed them um like so many uh kelpians in in, in flying <laughs> ships um so then you do that again where it's like oh, we're back against the wall there's nowhere what are we gonna do oh the prophets are here to save us you know i wish i wish it was i wish the the outcome of of Cisco arguing with the prophets was something was something like them being like, okay, we're not going to just fix the situation for you, but here's a piece that will allow you to X, Y, and Z or something. You know, I would I would have had them because they are time traveler aliens. I would have just had them reset the minefield. I think, um, and that stalls things. Oh, that's interesting. Enough. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that would have been okay at that point. The fleet would still exist, but the, the prophets would take an action that we've seen them do before because they have yeah. a hard time understanding what time means. So they can just fix things if they want to. Mm -hmm. Um, that would have been, I it. actually, oh, go, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I'm, I'm done. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I actually, I, I really did like that. They didn't manage to, um, uh, shut down th that they didn't manage to stop them from blowing up the minefield. Yeah, it felt unique uh, for Star Trek, didn't it? Like it's surprised you're like, oh my god, they didn't actually succeed in what they were trying to do. Yeah, I think unfortunately though, that's where you get into to it, it, you kind of have to flip a coin, I guess, in a, in situations like this because it's either they accomplish their goal and they shut down and they and they stop them from deactivating the minefield, and then you finish your story in a more or, organic or not or, organic isn't the right word, but Simplistic. in a more uh, simplistic or or um uh earthbound for lack of a better expression way of doing it or you have them blow up the minefield and then you're like well okay how do we get out of this now right which i always appreciate if the answer if the question you're asking is okay how do we get out of this now because it means you've made an interesting story decision yeah but wait <laughs> If your answer is, what if our god aliens show up and just wipe the Jem'Hadar off the board? It's like, ah, oh, okay. So I, I'm, I, I don't know if I prefer that. but Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's tough because I, I do like the moment where they shut down the mines and they blow it up. Yeah. And you're kind of like, oh, well, yeah. that's really interesting. But at that point, you, you realize that there's only five minutes left in the episode and the Jem'Hadar aren't coming through uh, the wormhole. Like, that, that seems clear at that point because... If, They've been saying that if this happens, it's pretty much all over. So you know that it can't happen. So it does fall back into that just kind of like 
quick cut fix here to do things. Um, I I think the episodes are strong enough where it doesn't dis- the ending doesn't destroy everything that had come before that. Like I mm-hmm. I still feel it was all kind of worthwhile, and it's not a total waste of time by the time that you get to the end. That might just be sort of my nostalgia and realizing what's still to come in the series uh, mm-hmm. playing into it. But I don't know. It's it, it's a it's a tough one because I think that. I think it ties into what I think the show did well across the entire uh, war storyline was that they had they had some character arcs and stories that like really worked well uh, the entire the way through, and then a lot of them that actually didn't work particularly well. It felt kind of odd, like they were trying to find their their footing and how you're supposed to write this thing. And I, I think that the the like it, it it's interesting in that it doesn't feel particularly Star Trekky in a lot of ways. Like it's the 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 t- what the show is about like sort of totally changes once they enter into this kind of world where it's all now about these character on character scenes as opposed to a greater thought about what the war means to them yeah. at least across this yeah. arc like there's we talked about with Odo and the founders there's no neg- there's no negotiation there between like what Odo's worldview would be and why he would be enamored with the changelings and everything and there's not really a sort of mention outside of just like the tertiary, like this is where we're fighting the dominion because the dominion are bad and things like that. It, it simplifies it into a much more of like an actiony sci-fi series. And I, I don't know if it does it. I don't know if it's super satisfying. Like, I think it's interesting as a sort of sidestep or side diversion for Star Trek, but I don't know if yeah. Star Trek should always be this way. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I think the reason that it works is that the character stuff is so good? Yeah, um, most and of it. I think yeah, and that's and that's what I what I mean when I say uh, they were doing a lot, but I wish that they you know had uh, done it slower, um, because the character stuff they're doing is really interesting. I just wish that there was more of it, mm. uh, and that they weren't they didn't have to get in and get out in six episodes, like the stuff with Kira um, on uh, and Tar- Tarek Nor. And the Odo stuff, I, I, I could have gotten, like, a whole season out of that, I think. Yeah, um, yeah, you could have. Like, especially if, if the thing that you're doing with if, – if the thing that you're doing with Odo is trying to uh, lure him back to the side of the founders, I think if you had more time, you could do something that's more interesting than just, like, she was just – She gave she a really good hand his, job. She just, <laughs> yeah, she was just touching his dick for four episodes, <laughs> and all of a sudden he's back in the fold. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I I think nice there's, there's more. Nice use of fold as a uh, metaphor for vagina well, there. Excellent. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, I was. Well, that's what the changelings do. <laughs> um, is they they fold and they 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 change. Um, <laughs> but you know what I mean, though. It's like I I, I found the Odo stuff so tedious because it was like every scene was like the same thing over and over again. Where yeah. it was like the the link. You don't understand the solids. You aren't part of them. The link. Yeah. It's... You'll never be a solid. Kira will never love you. The link. And, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I, I get it. The, the the combined screen time of this story is like maybe 10 minutes across six episodes. Yeah, it's it's um, it's never good storytelling to have a character just say, you just can't understand my motivation for this. Yeah. <laughs> like, not in an yeah, artistic way. It's just like, I, I can't really explain this because no one knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, and you've got the whole thing with Odo getting onto the uh, the Council of Elrond or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, Never see those. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a scene about yeah. that. Yeah, and you know, like I think that was that could have been part of the story too. Is uh, it, uh, is how that shakes out? And you know, I thought the stuff with the putting Kira and Odo against each other, um, at least as far as like how they're handling things, was really interesting. But they just didn't have any time to get into that like i it, it, i would have loved if they did a whole season of occupied deep space nine and yeah, it's too bad that they couldn't um because i mean that would have been i mean i was actually just thinking about this uh i it kind of fit now don't crucify me for this uh if you think of these six episodes as a season it kind of feels similar to the last season of Game of Thrones. Where sure, you think that they're, that they're trying to get to a point and they need to get there in a limited amount of time. It, well, it just feels like they have a lot of story that they want to get to. Yeah, yeah and they yeah. J- they can, they only get six six episodes to do it before they got to get back to the status quo. 
So they're sort of like moving things along fairly quickly, making big jumps as far as where characters are positioned and stuff. And some characters fare better than others. And, uh, you know, and you have an unsatisfying end involving a, um, a uh, supernatural occurrence or, well, you, or well, character. You know, the, the difference I see between this and Game of Thrones is that I see a lot of what I see is the story that they didn't get to is story that the series actually never even really hints at. But I'm thinking about like, oh, that would be interesting if they did that. Or, whoa, why is that happening? Yeah, it's different from Game of Thrones where Game of Thrones was like, very, very complicated for a while, and then they're like, "Oh shit! Like we we got the finish line coming yeah, up. Like we've got to we got to wrap this up." This feels more like, like for for as and I agree with you that I feel that they could have fit a lot more into this over the course of this arc. There's a there's a fair amount of wasted time, it, yeah. like in terms of not that the scenes are bad, but stuff that like you don't really like the Alexander episode is a yeah, is a yeah. waste of a sixth of the war arc because yes. if you were doing a whole season I could understand that episode existing there. Yep. And mm -hmm. but the way that they have it you have so little time that it feels really like a distraction and and like you say I like the way Yoon talking about the painting thing. Uh mm -hmm. but that feels like it's an idea about that's the Vorta questioning like how sad it is that they were genetically manipulated. Like him, that's way even yeah. without realizing the tragedy of his life, talking about it. And that would work in a much longer story where you had time to get to that. But the the pace of this just needs the battle to happen. You got Kira to do this. You got to have this coming. You got to have Odo flip. You got to do this. And I would, I agree. I would have liked to have seen a whole season based on this idea. Yeah. And I think that's unfortunately a, a, a failing of, of the time that the show was made. You know, yes. um, they were I, they were facing I, uh, intense pressure to wrap this up. They did not want this. To, the executives did not want this storyline to continue. That's really interesting to me. I would be curious to know why that is. Just be, I mean, like what you're you're six seasons into Deep Space Nine, right? Like yep. what is doing this? Are you really that concerned about the ratings at this point? They shouldn't be like, no. Yeah, like, you know, it's either people are watching it or nobody's watching it. And if you're going to keep it on the air, just let them do whatever the fuck they want. Yeah. You know, I, it's it's not like you're you're banking on, oh, what, you, we're, we're extending our war war arc to 12 episodes instead of six. I can't. Well, I guess we're going to lose 17 million viewers. It's like, <laughs> right. I, you know? You, the, the, to play devil's advocate, I think you have to go back to the point where if you were an executive in this position, this is before easily recordable TV is happening. So... Yeah, they're they're playing episodes that if you came in on, you know, episode four out of this six arc series, you'd be fairly confused as to what's going on. Yeah, and that's fair. Like you know, they had a hard enough time doing two parters, and they they would make it obvious. So I, I would at the same time though, like ahead. yeah, at the same time, six seasons in Deep Space Nine. How yes. many people are going to be like, you know what? I think I'm going to check this show out. <laughs> I've heard good things. You know. The what year is this? What year is this on right now? Ninety seven. Ninety seven. Okay. I I was gonna say I I thought maybe it was later. In, I couldn't. I wasn't sure if it was later into the sort of downturn of Star Trek, where like the people who are watching Star Trek are the people who enjoy Star Trek and literally nobody. Oh else. sure. No, I think this is still the DS Nine is not doing well in the ratings at this point. Like it's yeah. really not doing a barn burner. That would be the counter argument if I was the creative on the show. I'd say no one's the people who are watching are watching. So let's just do what we yeah. want to do. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's too bad. I mean, I think I I do like it. Um, I think it was a, a, a bold um, experiment, and uh, I think they are hindered by the era which that which it was made in 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 the way that they they they're doing the serialized thing, but they are also oddly they still have a foot in the episodic thing. So it's like every episode has to move the story along. But we have to do this episodic thing, so it's like we can't really sit and marinate in some of the choices that we've made. We have to have, you know, Kira and Odo have a scene in Quark's bar where they're talking about the, the thing that's the problem this week and not really dealing with the stuff that was a problem the last week. Yeah, I, I would say that the, that problem probably manifests most in the Odo storyline because the Odo storyline yeah, to me... Yeah, I was me, just using the two of them as an example. Yeah, the Odo storyline to me feels like it's a a victim of the episodic thing where they have to tell the audience each episode why Odo is talking to the changeling. Like, they have to be like, yeah. well, remember, Odo, we've linked and you are now addicted to the sex that I'm giving you. So <laughs> we are going to talk about this for another 10 minutes. And they... 
And I think that the show actually, I would give them credit. A couple of the storylines do cross the episodic boundary where like a choice mm-hmm. is made and the, the outcome or the consequences of that do res, uh, rever, 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 reverberate. <laughs> they do resonate into the next episode in a way that's kind of unique. Um, a reverberate, but, a reverberate is what you get when you, uh, when you, you punch send change a coup- <laughs> when, you, when you, when you send a coupon in, you get money back. I believe that's a reverberate, right? It's a, it's one that doesn't expire is a forever bait. Yes. Um, yeah, forever bait. Uh, that, that, well, that seems the... like forever baiting is what Odo is doing now. <laughs> He's a, um, what are they called? Incels or something? He's an involuntary <laughs> solvent at this point. Not his choice. He's going to be driving a van across a bridge at some point. Um, the hell was I talking about? Well, I, th- I think that they did a pretty. It, it was a mixed bag, I suppose. Like yeah. I, I want to praise the show for what they did. I don't want to sound negative on this arc because I do like the arc. And yeah. while I was watching it, I was kind of like, oh, well, it'll be interesting to see the next episode to see how this like ties into the next thing and go from there. So we'll we'll get even more of a um a sense of the arc, I think, when we start moving after this one into the more episodic regular DS Nine stories that they used to do, uh, which is next what week. Next week, things are back to normal, and Quark deals with an alien that won't stop eating. That's right. Morn is back. We got the wedding next episode, so everything yeah. everything goes back to normal. Um, yeah, the um, you know, I think the thing, man, I'm so disappointed with the Quark stuff. I I just can't get past because I I know what you're saying, where it's like they have to they have to keep reminding people what's going on, but I think they're doing that at the at the uh, um at the sacrifice of having Odo do literally anything. Oh, sorry, right. you said you said Quark. You're disappointed in the Odo storyline. Yeah, yeah, did yeah. I say Quark? You said Quark, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I actually like. I thought the Quark story was pretty good. Yeah, I think he's pretty good too. That's um, why I was uh, I was shocked. But yeah, the Odo storyline. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, the Odo stuff. It, like he, it's such a good thing to do with him, but they don't do anything with him. They just have him. They just let him, he just stays in his room for five episodes. Yeah, and like there's no he never makes a decision after. Uh, he teams up with uh you know his 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 lady there um that goes against kira or or the 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 people of the the station or acts in a way that is out yeah. of character for him he commits he, sins it, of omission it, instead of sins of intent like he he exactly, by, by yeah. not doing anything he causes problems to happen yeah which i think is not very good television yeah um because yeah, you, you're just taking him out of the situation and 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 making him, uh, his yeah his his uh, what's the line from the 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 Rush song? Uh, if you decide not to make a ch- if, if if you, you choose, choose to make to a, not to decide, yeah. you still have made a choice, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, yeah, and it's like okay, fine. I guess you could make an argument that that's something, but that's not very compelling. Um, as t- uh, compared to how it would be if like oh yeah, he's under the. Uh, He's he's being seduced by the founder, which is changing his mind. So now he's treating people this way, or or he's arresting these people, or he's making these decisions on the council. And I think it's just they had so many great ideas that they just didn't have time to to, to really get into it, a lot of them. Yes, I, I, I think some of them that. though. I mean, to, to be fair, I, to you know, overall, I, I agree. I think it was I liked it overall. I think it was uh, it was definitely um, a really great uh, experiment and i think what they actually did is pretty remarkable as far as as you know star trek in general goes uh at the time anyway yes um it's very different from everything else that they were doing yeah yeah and you know i i don't i I don't mean to sound like super negative about it but like i loved i loved the kira stuff even if even if they didn't uh, do as much as i would have hoped i thought her whole thing with ducat was great i thought the um the angle of the resistance is even as silly as it was at points I thought was good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> they can't, they can't even sit at quarks and not look suspicious. I know they're like, all bowed they, heads together whispering and yeah. Yeah. No, no maybe they should have stuck to like fondue parties in somebody's room or something. Cause like they're all sitting around. And it's like, Hmm, the only four people we have to worry about seem to keep congregating at that back corner table and talking very close to each other's faces. It's a good point. There's no scene where it's in the middle of work, where like Rom comes up and hands Kira a pad and then whispers something yeah. to her, or like it wouldn't look so suspicious about what's going on. Yeah, yeah it's them sharing drinks at a uh, cocktails at a bar. You know how you know what how this would have been different if they did it a mo- a modern thing. 
Well, first of all, I was going to say the problem with the resistance angle is there's no resistance. It's just four people. Yes. Like, yes. it's not like this growing movement until Odo shows up at the end with a bunch of Bajoran guys who have just <laughs> appeared out of nowhere with guns. Yeah. Um, but like, I was thinking if, if they had done this angle now, the end would have been the resistance suddenly makes themselves visible where the people on the ship start rebelling against the Cardassians and the founders fighting back on deep space and that kind of yes, thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but they never get to that. As far as we know, the resistance is only four people. It's like the end of last Jedi where they have this like, uh, um, great hero shot of like, can't you wait to see what happens to the rebellion next? And you're looking at the screen going, as far as I can tell, the rebellion is two broken robots, yeah. a glass dog, an old woman, and like four guys. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really seem like a big threat against the fucking uh, First Order here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, you know, it, so it's... I, I, I like what they're doing. Uh, I think the intent was great, and I think the ideas they had were great. Um, I just wish they could have had more time to really get into it. Yes. And I think that... Um, I think that my, my big thing that I kind of miss out a little bit here... I think there are hints of it, but I... I I think that the way that they would have made this a more Star Trek-y thing, as opposed to this more action-centered uh, focus, is I think they should have fleshed out the Dominion ethos a little bit more than they do. Uh, they do it with the Changelings yeah. a little bit, but I wish that the Dominion were a little bit more fully sketched than they are, because I think they do really interesting stuff with the Cardassians against the Dominion. And I think that mm -hmm. you see a big, important difference there between what's going on and how shaky of an alliance it is. And because of that, I think you get really amazing scenes with Wayun and Dukat in this. I think if, if Kira wins this, I think Dukat comes in second place for his uh, yeah, characterization. And... I guess I want to wrap this up with a little bit of Dukat here, because mm -hmm. in, in contrast to the Dominion, he's, as we said, much more obsessed and much more interested and um, invested in winning this little battle for the Alpha Quadrant on a personal level. Is his going insane at the end over the top, or is this okay? Yeah, it feels a little over the top. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, it's he doesn't seem to be... I guess it all depends on how you think he feels about his daughter, like you were saying before. Because, uh, yeah, I think they were playing it, at least I was reading it as they were playing it as though he really loves her. But I feel like up to that point, maybe that was true, but it, he seemed to be using her as kind of a pawn in general. Like, I'm talking before this episode. I think in this episode, they're they're really leaning into him. He loving, loving her. her. I'd, I'd agree with that 100%. Yep. But every, I mean, up even in this arc, he's using her as a pawn against Kira. Um, and she's always just another piece of the puzzle for him. She's not like this. Her know, glory uh, seems to be important for his glory. It's kind of a, yeah. because she's my daughter, and if she does well, it reflects well on me. That's how I interpret yeah. his, like, his uh, response to her art and things like that. Yeah. I think I would have appreciated it more if he killed her, I think. Um, I misremembered it. I thought Dukat did kill her, and that's not yeah. the case at all. Yeah, it's Damar that does it. Like, I think that would have been more in character for him to kill her. And then maybe that drives him nuts. I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah but him, I, I think him going insane is a bit much. Because uh, he, he's such a character of, uh, he's he's so aware of the back and forth of things, you know? Yeah. Like he's he's always able to adjust to however the tide has shifted. Yep, he's a planner um, and a schemer, and a uh, he's well he's able to adjust, as you say. Yeah. Yeah, and I know that obviously losing Deep Space Nine is a is a huge loss for him, and I think that scene where he freaks out about it was great, but I don't know if that is necessarily a catalyst for him losing his mind. Even though I guess it's the daughter that drives him nuts, but <coughs> excuse me. Uh, the the two things combined, it's like I don't know. That, I feel yeah, like I, yeah. I feel like they could have played it differently. Like I would have I would have had him play it more like just de generally defeated instead of like nuts. I would have yes. I, I did, for the final scene you're talking about, I, I would have done that yeah. instead of him talking to himself. I think just him sort of like uh, like what have I become? Kind of an ending for him would be okay, or maybe not a what have I become, but kind of like I can't believe it ended up this way for me. Yeah, I, exactly. I could have seen him killing her if, and I think it would have been more true to what I view as their relationship is at the the thing where she says that she helped them. He 
says, I knew I could never trust you, kind of. Like, there's a... Yeah. He, he His Ducatness there of, I've always been using you and I can't even trust my own daughter comes through. And that mm-hmm. is the reason that he snaps at that point. They yeah. they played a little bit too lovey-dovey of him. Like, come back to Cardassia with me. Everyone will be fine. We'll, be, we'll have a good time. And I don't know why they did that. I assume it's a trope of just they can't have the main villain kill somebody, I guess. Maybe. I, yeah. I don't know what it is. Be, but He does. I mean, killing his own daughter does send him off the deep end into into fairly irredeemable I yes guess. yeah that's that's true i just it, it's funny because he's he's basically adolf hitler you know like that's the yeah. ca- like he, he's been a man who ran a prison camp who killed and raped people and yeah. he's, they're he's like he not, can't he's kill his less daughter hitler he's less hitler he's more uh ray fine's character in schindler's list yeah sure yeah you know the, but, the, yes, the underling general yeah is that um yeah. That's not Goebbels or whatever, but yeah, yeah, and I know who you mean, yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I it's yeah, having him lose his mind at the end is is seems kind of coming over the top, um, and it kind of it it lessens the defeat for me a little bit, you know, where it's like I would rather see him defeated than oh now he's crazy, you yeah. know. Um, like I would probably, I, I, I liked, I liked him handing back the baseball, but I feel like if, I feel like him being more or less of his own mind, handing back the baseball would have been a lot more impactful, you know, instead of like crazy man hands back baseball. (laughs) Yeah. I would have had him destroy the baseball and give him back the tatters of it. Like how oh, Cisco yeah. destroyed DS9 when he gave it back to the Cardassians. That's what I would have done with the baseball. Yeah, that would have been good. Um, I was also thinking it would have been nice if he was like, you know, instead of handling the baseball. Is he only handling the baseball in that scene where he's going nuts? Uh, he's playing with it in every office scene, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was thinking it would have been nice if he was like uh, doing some business with uh, Zial's earring thing. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, yep. something like that. Oh, yeah. Like um, uh, her Bajoran earring. Yep. Yeah. 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 That that would have been good. I, I, I do like the Ducat arc. I think they did pretty well. I'd agree that the landing is not particularly great that they stick in this episode with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think he's, he, I, I think the actor is great. I think the actor yeah, plays really him good. really well. And it's a subtle kind of villain. And I'd have a hard time not saying that Ducat isn't probably the one of the top Trek villains, I think. Like, he's just, he's very... Oh, I, 100% he is, yeah. Yeah, like, I mean, Khan is fine and everything, but Khan is much less nuanced than Dukat yeah. is. I think Dukat's written in a more interesting way. Yeah, I would say as far... I would say... As far as... At least as far as number of quality appearances, he's got to be the top one. Mm. You know, because, I mean, if you think of, like... The, the big recurring villains from Star Trek, um, I guess Khan counts because he's got two appearances. <laughs> yeah, Q, um, Q would be something. Yeah, the Borg Q would, would be, be one, but Q has is not great. No. Uh, the more Q you get, <laughs> the Borg is great, but the more Borg you get, the less good it gets. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even lore is gets shitty yeah, after a while. Yeah. Uh, Ducat is pretty consistently great. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just a um, when you come from a more grounded place as a character, other than this is Data's evil brother, kind of like yeah. that. That's, yeah. It's a little bit. You have a little bit more room to wiggle. I think when the character comes from a a backstory that's believable, and you can sort of build naturally off of it. And, and I mean, places. let's that's not to short shrift Tasha Yar's alternate reality half Romulan rape baby. Yes. Who's the, the more you see her, uh, the just the better and better that she gets. Yeah. You know, I I, I was going to ask. I I don't know if this if the scene with with Ducat and Wayun covers this, but I was thinking. You know, you said uh, uh, how they don't do any scenes with that. Uh, you know, foreign council meeting. Yeah. Um, I think it would have been great if they had a scene with that group where they were talking about Bajor, because I feel like. The between Ducat, Weyun, and Odo, and Odo's, you know, depending on where his his uh, loyalties lie at yeah, the moment, he's the sliding scale on that argument. Yeah, I think you could have a really interesting uh, uh, 
character c- contrast about how they all feel about Bajor, you know? Yeah. But I I do feel like they kind of cover that with, with the Earth conversation. Um, But it would have been nice to do a scene with that group it, when it with because again earth is like okay fine everybody knows what earth is uh but if you're if you're staying within the confines of of the world that you set up bejor really is is the thing everybody wants it is the for, earth for this universe yeah, yeah yeah so you know and ducat has a very specific feeling about bejor he wants to rule bejor he doesn't want them wiped out yep uh in wayun i could see his point of view being more or less what it is about earth where, or if not the same point of view where it's like, Oh, in order to rule, we need to destroy these people. It could just be, it could have been him being like, you know what? These guys are kind of like, why are we treating them this way? They don't, they don't add anything to us. Why don't we just wipe them out? You know, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then Odo, wherever he lies would be kind of interesting. I think that that's a, that would have been a great scene that unfortunately they, they don't have. Yeah. It's something to sort of build a little bit more tension towards what Starfleet needs to do. I think Bajor, like the imminent destruction of Bajor could have been something that would have provided a little bit of Starfleet kick in the pants for their storyline up until the point where they have to close the, or uh, shut down the mines on the wormhole. I'm legit surprised that they brought earth into the equation because like it's, I don't know where earth is in comparison. Like the, (laughs) <laughs> the way that they talk about it, it sounds like it's like 30 miles away. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm I'm surprised they didn't stick to something more relatable like Bajor. Um, because, I mean, I guess if you really need to mobilize Starfleet to, to send all of their ships, then I guess Earth is the one, is the easiest one to use. I should say all of their ships except for the Enterprise, which apparently is fucking off doing something else. Yeah. Um. But I think Bajor is such an interesting uh, uh, focal point for everybody. Because even when you get into the Starfleet stuff, it's like, yeah, Bajor is important, but do we want to? Do we really need to mobilize to do this? And then you've got Cisco talking about, you know, Bajor and how much he wants to build a summer home there. Yeah. Um, you know, th- so you can get across in a, in a scene why Cisco cares about Bajor so much instead of him just dropping it in casual conversation. Um, I think that could have been real. And, you know, then you have the Admiral <clears throat> who's like, yeah, obviously Bajor is important, but you know, if Bajor goes down, it's not the end of the war or whatever, right. you know, that kind of thing, you know, you could have that kind of thing going. So I'm, su- I'm surprised that they, that they went with earth. Yeah. Yeah. Just the, uh, home is where the heart is, I guess, for the viewers. Yeah, I, I guess I- it's, <laughs> it is, if you're, if you're trying to amp up the dominion threat, uh, then I guess Earth makes sense because it's like, you know, all right, well, the hub. that's very, very relatable. Yeah, it's the hub of stuff. And, you yeah. know, I, I always I have a, I always have a hard time with it because I'm like, in this universe, are there more people not on Earth than on Earth? Yeah. Like more humans yes. like not yeah. on Earth. So like if you it's like being having an ant problem in your yard and you focus on one anthill and you're like, as soon as yeah. I fuck that anthill up, everything's going to be gone. But you you've got ants all over the place. Yeah, I, I I was thinking about um, <clears throat> I uh, years ago I, I was reading something about the Roman Empire and about how like the majority of people who were part of the Roman Empire had never been to Rome. Yeah, yeah. And it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, if you're under Roman rule in like Britannia and you get you get the a raven comes by and says Rome has fallen, you're like. Okay. Yeah. Here's the new boss, I mean, same as the old. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'll, I guess that means that the badges change, but uh, it doesn't really. <laughs> so where am I sending really these taxes me. at this point? Like, is there a new PO yeah. box or something I have to get this to? Yeah. I'd agree. Let's. Uh, we talked for an hour. Let's take a break. We're going to play an audio clip. We are going to read some patron thoughts, and then we'll give our final thoughts about favor the bold and sacrifice of angels. Sir, the wormhole is opening. Defiant. Our reinforcements must be right behind. No, oh, sir. There's no sign of them. That's impossible. Check our listening posts in the Gamma Quadrant. They're not there either. But they entered the wormhole. Where are they? I don't know. The Defiant has opened fire on us. Obviously. Can you get our weapons back online? Not for a while. Sir, 200 enemy ships have broken through our lines. They're headed this way. Time to start packing. Contact our forces in the Alpha Quadrant. Tell them to fall back to the Cardassian territory. 
It appears this war is going to take longer than expected. We'll meet you at airlock five. Sir? Victory was within our grasp. We have to evacuate the station, sir. Bajor, the Federation, the Alpha Quadrant, all lost. We have to go now, sir. Go. The Federation ships, they'll be here soon. We have to get back to Cardassia. I have to find my daughter. I'll send someone for her. That won't be necessary. You're wasting your time. Ramanan! She won't go with you! Alright, everybody. So, if you want to support the show, if you've enjoyed this content that we filled your morning with, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash the Penske file. A couple dollars a month, you get extra stuff, you help the show keep going, you keep the lights on, you do all these other cliches that I spout at this point, and you also, if you're a Captain Tier supporter, you get a shout-out at this point. So, thanks very much. Go to Andrew Sherlock, Ben Douglas, Bradley Killens, Captain Quark, Cardinal Doomsday, Christian Pouch, David K, Dwayne Hackett, Eric Johnson, Yarpy, Joint Mango, Kevin Reyes, Kyle Barrett, Matt Flores, Matt Cutler, Matt Ross, Mike Burnett, Nathan Elliott, Neil Brennan, Nick Sergi, Robert Cummins, Russell Elledge, Samuel Custer, Grim Santo, Sean Spinobi, Stephen Cobb, Tark Latif, and Will Yates. Thank you very much for supporting the show. Thank you for being there, guys, as we made it through the DS9 occupation arc. And now let's read some patron thoughts, Clay, shall we? Poindexter G says, Favor the bold sacrifice of angels. Star Trek completely nails their first attempt at a multi-arc, multi-episode arc, multi story arc. They split up the cast and give everyone, including recurring characters, something to do. Yes, we're largely back to the status quo at the end of it, but it was great to see everything in disarray for a little bit. Can I say, thank God they split up the cast? Because I don't think people realize, generally, how boring it is to have everybody in the same place in a story like this yes. until somebody does it, and then you go, Jesus, people are just... You've got every scene has 15 people in it sitting around. Yeah, it would be it would be an even more obvious resistance meeting, I think, with the entire yeah. cast <laughs> is sitting around one table talking about what they're doing. David K says, Favor the Bold, there's a deceptively small moment that stands out as being very significant in Trek history. Cisco is, expresses a desire to build a house and settle on Bajor, the first time in the franchise where a captain is not obsessively wedded to his ship or command. This sets Cisco apart and both deepens and continues to humanize him. The character's arc is one of the most complex and believable in Trek. Compare where Cisco was in the pilot to where he finds himself here. It's great storytelling and part of what makes Cisco the most interesting captain character in Star Trek. Uh, next one is... That's not it. Favor the Bold. Zam Nuclear Wessel. I like the visual where Morn looks up anxiously and Kira and Quark look down at him darkly. Very reminiscent of the Maltese, Maltese Falcon. What makes, uh, which makes sense, given Rom paraphrasing the Casablanca speech to Lita a few episodes earlier. I do like the um, the design of Morn, I think, is really great. Like, he yeah. looks kind of like a sad sack character. I just like the the, uh, the makeup and the costume that he wears. He's very funny. Yeah, I would also like to say, I forgot to mention, uh, I think my favorite line, <clears throat> excuse me, my favorite line of both episodes, uh, because I feel like I've, I've suddenly discovered an ethos which to live by. Mm-hmm. Is uh, Garrick saying, I always hope for the best, but experience has taught me to expect the worst? Yeah, yep. Good line. <laughs> it's home. It's basically um, how I feel most, yeah. most days. Yeah, you want to go the other way, I think, is the better way to live life, I suppose. Just uh, expect, the, <laughs> expect the worst and be surprised when the best comes up. Uh, Zam continues here. Dukat and Wayun trying to explain their philosophies of tyranny to each other and both failing to understand was pretty amazing. That, that's probably my favorite scene, I think, out of the entire thing. My my point about the Dominion was I wish there were more Dukats and Wayun scenes like that. There are a lot of them. I, I, I feel they could have been strengthened, and I feel that the Changelings could have been brought in a little bit better to that. Like, the Changelings feel a little bit outside of what the Dominion is doing to me, and I'm not sure it really works 100% uh, the whole yeah, way. Yeah. I, I wish the Changeling philosophy was a little bit more tied into the Dominion um, via, like, scripting, like, actually written that way. Yeah, it feels to me, it never feels to me like the Changelings are part of the, the like, it, the Vorta feel like the Dominion to me. Like they're the it, managers, like they're the, yeah. the ringleaders, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like the the changelings are so, you see them so few and far between, and they don't really, when you do see them, it's never like, at least in this arc anyway, uh, she's not there really doing Dominion-y stuff. No. You know, she's She just, checks in for war updates every once in a while, yeah. and then is that, which, which kind of makes, like, I can understand that they would leave that to the Vorta, 
it, it just feels like they're a little bit detached from everything. Like that they, and and as the episode says, their their interests are not aligned with what the Dominion seem to be wanted doing. So at the same time, I'm like, well, why are the Dominion doing that at that point? Like why why aren't they just completely captive to the whims of what the Changelings want, which seems to be to get Odo back? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Will Yates says, For me, Wayun and Kira's scene with the painting is one of the best Trek ever did. Combs and Visitor have a really nice chemistry, and you can never be too sure. Uh, you can never be sure to uh, have a really great chemistry that you can never be sure two actors will have. Kira's face shows, uh, shows how much Odo's betrayal hurts her in every scene. Dukat is a great villain, and I love the villain's downfall. I think Galemo did too. I can see his fixation on Zael coming from the fact that she's the last one who believes he's a good man, and he needs that. That's interesting, yeah. I really can't tell where Odo ends and the founder begins, but that link must be like crack. Christian Pouch. God damn, what a good ride. We get so many great character moments. Wayun and Kira with the painting, Nog getting promoted, Dukat and Wayun gloating too early. Rob uh, Rom proving that he's not a coward. Quark and Zayal teaming up. Kira's anger anger at Odo's betrayal. Odo quickly realizing he's an idiot. The tension of the race against time to stop the Dominion from destroying the minefield. The amazing space battle. Odo finally coming back to help. Zael's tragic death. It's not perfect, but it's one of the most exciting groups of episodes ever in Star Trek, and I love it. My my other favorite part, the little character thing, is how uh, how how happy Wayun is that Cisco got promoted. Yes. <laughs> when they when they're like, oh, Cisco's been promoted. He's like, oh, good for him. Yeah. <laughs> I. I'll just say it one more time before the arc is over. I really like the Wayun character. Yeah, like, he's great. Yeah. It's just a. It would have been so easy for him to just be the authoritarian sort of like bureaucratic number cruncher who comes in, but I think they do, they do good work with writing him and the performance and everything. He's he's yeah. just a very good foil to Dukat. Is like how villains are supposed to act. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Matt Ross says, "Where the one-two punch? Be- what a one-two punch between episodes! I would say part one is better than part two in its setup." Captain Dax seems kind of tame to me. The delivery of her line shows, shows that she is more suitable for the science position. Cisco's bold maneuvering is exactly what's needed to jolt a success against an almost implacable foe. The station's characterization still is stronger than Starfleet's. Dukat maniacal, Wayun is the most evil in plotting, Kira the ultimate terrorist, Quark the unwitting freedom fighter. Lita's whimpering makes me long for her demise. The, the sex, that's true. Yeah, her whimpering is a weird uh, quirk. You've never cared about anybody? Come on, man. That's true. <laughs> The sex scene with Odo is as ridiculous as it was in the final battle, v the final battle. Zael's arc did not surprise me. Her death in Dukat's fall to madness, however, was unexpected, as was Damar's attempt to rid Dukat of his weakness in killing her. Wayun's je- I, Go ahead. I was sorry. My other thing about the death is I was surprised that w- Dukat didn't turn around and just shoot him. Sure. That's that's what I was expecting. I was expecting, you know, you know, she he shoots her and then he's like, yeah, you know, like one of the not. Not a super uh, dramatic thing, but like just a quick turnaround and boom, shoots him kind of thing. Like, yeah, right. It's, it, if know. he's going to react that way, you think he would react more violently than he actually does yeah. um, against it. That would seem to be more in line with Dukat. Wayun's genocide idea for Earth, unlike other bad guys in Star Trek, seemed to bear more weights as we saw it previously against others. The sense of urgency with the mines was to me well-paced and desperate. The inevitable battle has weight even as nameless ships give their lives in fiery death. The intervention of the prophets, however, is a god alien plot that always fell flat for me. But hey, in some ways it works. The Dominion po- politely leave with an exit cue from the computer, and the good guys stand on their feet at last. A fun, tension-filled ride that makes you wonder what happens next. I also, I also did really like the way uh, uh, Ducat plays, or I guess Alemo plays uh, ZL's death scene, mm-hmm. where he's, uh, you know, I, I think. I I I really liked that scene where he's like, as she's slipping away, he's like, "I love you, I love you, I love you," you know that kind of thing. I thought that was really good. Yeah. Um, I think that might have been a little bit more impactful if it had been clear previously that he was using her in this episode that he was trying to you know position her. Sure. Like you know, it's it one seems of those like an apology at the end. Yeah. 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 She's there. He's using her for whatever reason. Uh, and then at this moment where she's dying, he's just, you know, pour, really pouring out his emotions. Yeah, he's, he's know, trying to get the yeah. point across that this is how he actually feels before <clears throat> yeah, she passes yeah, yeah. away. Yeah, yep. Uh, Yarpy says, final comment, action-packed finale for the story arc. The space combat is pretty well done, but could really use a remastering. They put some nice touches in the character work, such as Dukat and Wayun's plans about what to do with Earth, which shows nicely their different personalities. The fall of Dukat was a bit unexpected, but I think the writers thought they'd gone as far as they can with the character as he is. 
I didn't really care for the deus ex machina ending, but I don't think the writers had any other way out given the time limit of the episode. A few words about the whole arc and Tarek Noir, Tarek Noir compared to Starfleet stuff. I think they could have done a lot better with the scenes set with the Starfleet crew if they'd shown news reports coming from the front lines and or show the map where the battle lines are drawn since they're retreating. Can't do and, it. What's that? Can't do it. There's no news in Star Trek. That's true. Well, Jake, Jake's uh, got his one-man Breitbart show going out there, but other than that, nothing much. Well, he's, he's basically got Creed's blog from The Office where it's just a Word document that says Creed blog at the top <laughs> yeah. where it's not going anywhere. He's just writing it on his own computer. Nothing scarier than the blank page. Uh, I think everyone will agree with that. One of the bigger problems with sci-fi shows, and especially with Star Trek, is that you don't get a sense of where places are situated and how far they are from each other, etc. Maybe they don't want to get stuck with the map created for specific shows in case they need to change stuff so they kept it more ambiguous. But the lack of sense of scale is, for lack of a better word, problematic. Thank That's you, patrons. True. I would agree. Yeah, they never do maps. And it's always interesting when you look at like fan-made maps and you're like, oh, things are over here, things are over there. Well, they had that one map. In the background of uh, Cisco's office, where it was just like a bunch of colored lines and then some floating Star Trek badges. <laughs> with, with like lines circling, like they they drawn arrows yeah. that were circling the galaxy to go. Like I now. assume that was supposed to be the, the Star Trek version of every time they do one of those maps where they've got the little pieces that are supposed to represent each side and everything. But yep. just using the Star Trek badge seemed really weird. <laughs> They had that episode where the, the Starfleet badge flies into the Cardassian badge and it blows it up and it disappears off the screen <laughs> off the screen and you're like dead. Got them all. All right, so that's it. Thank you, patrons, very much for your comments. Hope everyone enjoyed our coverage of the war arc. We're back to more standard DS9 at this point next uh, in the next episode. But Clay, on a scale of one to five, what are you gonna give this to Parter? Uh I'll give it a four. Okay. Um it's, it's tough. Like the the slight serialization actually makes the ratings very difficult for me. Mm. Um, I'm gonna say it's a five. I think I yeah. I just purely like this is a five based on uh, sort of ignoring quality almost. It's really just like I really That's enjoy fair. it as a wrap up. Uh, I guess, yeah. and I know it has problems. I know there are some storylines that kind of failed th throughout the arc and everything, but I. And I don't even know if this is one of the best episodes. I think Rocks and Shoals is a better episode of mm -hmm. this series than this. But I, I think this wrapped it up pretty well, even forgetting about the profits at the end and stuff like that. I this I think this is maybe my favorite DS9 two-parter. Like, if you just want to consider these two, I think that they do everything pretty well that they're trying to do. And I have to reward the show for that, I think. So I'll give it a five. Clay will give it a four. Um, that's it. Thank you very much, guys, for listening. All the links are down below. Click on them. Go to Twitter, Facebook, Discord. Go to patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to support the show. There's a whole bunch of other stuff down there you can click on. I think that's it. Um, anything else here? Clay, do you have anything you want to say? Badass came out today, so you can catch up yeah. on that, but I didn't mean to step on your toes. Go ahead. Yep, Badass Season 2 is back. We're doing Batman the Animated Series Season 2. And uh, again, next month I'll be running a Kickstarter for a book called Bloody Hell that I'll be doing, which is about Vikings in World War One. And I'm sure, I hope that sounds interesting because it sounds wacky, doesn't it? Uh, what, why is there only one hijinks. L in hell? Is that a Viking thing? Uh, yeah, I would, uh, t it, the Viking god of hell is, is H E L. Oh, I didn't so, realize there was a Viking god of hell. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I, I was, the, I was combining the, 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 the English slang phrase with the, the spelling of the, the Viking god. Gotcha. Yeah. But yeah, there'll be more information about that as it gets closer. I think that's it. Guys, check out Badass. All the Star Trek stuff goes on. You can check out the uh, the website, which I've been spending far too much time on re, uh, remastering. If they're not going to remaster the DVDs for DS9, I guess they'll just remaster the website. <laughs> you can check out that if you're interested. YouTube exists. Uh, this one will be going up with the new background, too, so hopefully things look nice there. That was just funny. It just sounded like in the middle you just dropped this just general general statement that YouTube as a concept exists. <laughs> <laughs> I found this thing on YouTube where someone's been uploading my podcasts to, uh, which is interesting, but we'll figure that out and get to the bottom of it. I, I was watching, uh, 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 looking through Kickstarter videos the other day, and uh, I saw <coughs> learning what makes and doesn't make a good one. Mm. And I saw this one where this guy was describing the story of his comic, and he's like, these two characters get sucked into hell where they have to fight off vampires, uh, vampires, werewolves. And a king, a, a demon king, who wants revenge against them for some unknown reason. And oh, sure. like, wait, did they? Do they not know the reason? Is it in the story that it's unknown, 
But it was just the that's saying it's for some unknown reason is not really getting me to the point where I want to find out what that reason is. No, it's um that feels like a first draft. Like when I have to write the blurbs for like the ep- excerpts for the podcast blurb to like summarize yeah, yeah. what a thing is. Like if you if you want a good writing exercise, try to summarize an episode of something in a sentence yeah, or two. Yeah, and. There's always your first pass, which is like terrible. Like you just you sort of blurt out all the things that happen in it, but it doesn't make any sense and it's not very like evocative language. And then you yeah, kind of whittle yeah. away at it until you can get it down to something manageable. But it's it would, it like the, the log line, uh, the first draft of a log line always ends for unknown reasons or like for yeah, th- people yeah. don't know why this is happening. But yeah, you it, build it, off it's it. It, it to me, it felt like it was like he was like, and there's a demon king who wants revenge on our heroes for parentheses uh find reason later yes yeah it's the placeholder guys thank you very much for listening thank you for supporting the show we'll be back with you're cordially invited in a couple days see ya